I have never seen so few patients in my life. <laughs> and as I sat there, I was somewhat bored, and I went down to see my old boss, the second Marine Division surgeon. And I walked into his office and we sat and he talked and he had a whiteboard and he looked at his whiteboard and as a Navy captain, specifically a medical officer, he was somewhat frantic about who he was going to put up there to go with 1st Battalion, 8th Marines, who was actually leaving with one map, the unit, the Marine Expeditionary Force from California. He said, I don't know who to put with 1-8. I, no, I have no doctors. They're going to residency. They're not going to be here. Everybody's got an excuse, and he moved names around, and in my head, in the back of my head, I said, you know, I'm really not doing anything. I'm pushing paper. I don't have a whole lot of real urgent things going on right now. Maybe I could go. And in the back of my head actually came out of my mouth, which <laughs> was a big mistake. As we all know, Navy, Navy stands for never again volunteer yourself. And I made that very large mistake that day. And as I watched my boss, my former boss, look quickly down at the bottom where they keep old doctors down here in the corner and grab my name and slap it up next to 1-8 and very calmly look and say, I'm going to call the general. <laughs> now I want to tell you about courage. Courage is not always being in combat. Sometimes courage is when you have to walk home and tell your wife, <laughs> who is eight months pregnant, after me having been home eight months, that somewhere between two and four weeks you will be leaving to go to Iraq. There's some ethic quandaries here because as I went up that driveway, I said, I'm going to tell her the truth. I'm going to tell her that I opened my mouth. But when it came out, it was, I'll be deploying in four weeks with 1st Battalion, 8th Marines. <laughs> my wife, who's a very small 115-pound lady who was at that point eight months pregnant, never curses. However, <laughs> being married to me, she must have learned a few that I didn't realize actually existed because when I finally got her off of my ear, she looked at me and said, well, that's where you're supposed to be. Somebody has decided you need to be with 1st Battalion, 8th Marines. And what's nice is when you're a doctor, you can call all the right people and do the right thing sometimes. And my wife was induced one week later, and we had a beautiful little girl. Four days after that, I left. And the entire time that she was giving birth, I'm not sure I was mentally there. I would already deploy. I sat and I thought to myself, what am I going to do? How am I going to be with these Marines? What am I going to teach these corpsmen? And how am I going to make them come home? And we didn't think about Fallujah at that point. When I've got the instructions, we were going to Haditha Dam. Up on the Euphrates River, we were going to sit up there and we were going to relax and do some combat patrols into a nice, calm village. And nobody was going to get hurt. And I thought to myself, well, then I'm going to train them about trauma, because this isn't going away, and they're going to be back. And I'm going to train all of my corpsmen how to take care of trauma if it happens. So I got my books together, and I went to the airplane, and I got on that airplane. And we started to make the long flight over, and I was reading, and I was making notes, and I was thinking, what the best? Because remember, I was, this is all new, this combat trauma. We've got Vietnam. I've got civilian training. I'm trying to put it all together and figure out how to best teach these guys what they can learn within a few short months and be able to make a difference. And as I'm doing all of that, I sat in my chair, and over the top of the chair in front of me was a large gunnery sergeant. <laughs> About 6'3", 240, 250 pounds. And he leaned over the chair. And this is not him, but this is what I felt like, having been to OCS, having been a Marine, and knowing that scary look that they have. And he had weapons. <laughs> 
And he was very menacing looking, but he looked over that chair and he said to me, sir, and I ignored him. I pretended like he didn't know that I was sitting there because he was gonna go away, but he didn't. He looked at me again and he said, sir, and I said, yes, Gunny. He said, you're our new battalion surgeon. And he said to me, the words that will echo in my head for the rest of my life, he said, I am glad I don't have your job. And I looked at him and I thought to myself and I said, you know, no, I'm glad I don't have your job. You're the guy who's gonna go out. You're the guy who's gonna shoot people and get shot at. That's not me. And he said to me the second most prolific words I've ever heard and he said, Sir, you're part of our team and we're going to get you everywhere you need to be. Please take care of us. Take care of us, take care of this battalion. That's a big load on an airplane ride over to Iraq. And when we got to Iraq, I settled in and we settled up on top of the dam and this is where I lived. This is my back window. I looked out at water in the middle of the desert. It was nice. And we trained and every day we trained with the corpsmen because I needed to take 54 of them. Now, there's not 54 in this picture. When I got there, it was hard to get 54 of them in one room at one time because they're 19, 20, 21 year old kids. Video players, TV watchers, just out of the hospital, most of them. I had a chief who was 38 and he was pulling his hair out saying, I, I'm not sure that they're even trainable. <laughs> And we came together with our plan and every day we would have sick call is all everywhere that happens. You have sick call and every day up on the top of the dam sick call would come and Marines would show up and they would a lot of times not really be that sick but not really interested in, in making a whole lot of moves during the day and maybe taking a day off and we ran them through the entire trauma protocol. Lie them on a stretcher, get two IVs in them, strip them down, <laughs> digital rectal exam, <laughs> and all run by Corman. The benefit to that was after about a week to two weeks, I had no more patients. <laughs> and my boss came to me, he said, Doc, what are you doing? I said, sir, you really don't want to know. He goes, this is the best turnout I have anywhere. There's no sick call ever. I said, well, we're going to fix that. Because I still needed to train. We stopped with the digital rectal exams and every day a new squad would come up and they would volunteer and they'd say, teach us about IVs and teach us about this ABCD that you guys talk about all the time, the airway, the bleeding, the circulation, the deformity, how you run this protocol. So I would teach them. The corpsman would teach them. The corpsman would run them through. This is Sergeant Lonnie Wells and he would bring to me his squad and they would come up frequently. And I remember Sergeant Lonnie Wells, we'd drink some coffee, his Marines would get stuck, they would stick my corpsman, we would enjoy the day and go about business till the end of October. And at some point I really actually had a team. These guys were actually good at what they did at sick call. My corpsmen were successful. I completed my mission, I'm ready to go home. Not so fast. I got the order about two days after this picture was taken that we were moving to Fallujah. We packed up and we started. We headed for the second battle of Fallujah and weren't sure actually if it was gonna be on or not, but it was an eight hour motor march. During that motor march, I went through everything I could think of to plan on how to do the right thing. As we headed towards Fallujah, I sat in this vehicle with the colonel. And he talked to his opso, he talked to me. And at one point he said to me, he said, all right, doc, what do you think? I thought, okay, I'm not sure what he's asking me. And he, he didn't leave me much room to think before he said, how do I get my Marines home? And I said, sir, well, we just don't go. And that's not possible. And I know that's not possible. And he got a chuckle out of it, but he said, Doc, help me. And I saw then that the dichotomy between what I had to do and what he had to do at that point was somewhat different. 
And I had to more align my thought process to what my boss had to do, and he had to take a piece of the city of Fallujah. And I needed to support him in any way I possibly could and to get his Marines home. And I thought about that and I came up with what I thought the plan was to be. And we put ourselves on the sand table and we talked about the plan and this is our battalion sitting there discussing where we were gonna be. And there were some medical assets outside on the assembly area, but not many. And we weren't gonna fly any type of casualty evacuation aircraft in so my plan was to set up at the breach point and evacuate patients to me, stabilize and get them back because it was taking over an hour to get from the breach point to any kind of surgical intervention. Everybody knows that there's a golden hour and Marines live and die by that. They say that to you. My colonel said there's a golden hour. If they're back in an hour, they're gonna live. If it's an hour, 50, 60, 60 minutes and one second, they may not live. But that's not true in combat trauma. Combat trauma, if you are shot, you are bleeding. You will die in five, 10, 15, 20 minutes. It's a spectrum. So I finally got my boss to buy off on me being that far forward at the, at the breach. And we went the next day and we dug in. We set up, and that night at 1900, the breach went off, and as far as I could tell, all hell broke loose. The Battle of Fallujah began. The Marines went in, and throughout the entire evening, they took one block, and they never, in my battalion, took a, a casualty. Night number one, good. 7.30 the next morning, I was sitting near the radio in the BAS when the call came across that there was a recon corpsman who had been shot and needed evacuation. So I called back and I said to the operations officer, I said, one of ours, no. Corpsman from Force Recon in direct support of another battalion. Didn't know the plan. So I linked up with my security, Captain Matt Kudelik, and he brought me into the center of the city, into the edge of the city, onto the edge of the city. Captain Matt Kudelik's a Marine. Captain Matt Kudelik doesn't believe in driving into the city, and I'm sure for some reason he's right that you shouldn't drive around in a combat zone, but he made me get off the vehicle at the edge of this city. And this is what I saw as we came off the vehicle and we started to move into the city, into the town, and I followed my Marines, my security element, and we moved around trying to find this recon marine in our sector, we, this recon corpsman. We knew he was there, and we walked, and we walked, and every window started to become a concern. And we started to clear snipers, and they start, the Marines started to do the things that Marines do. At one point, we crossed one of these alleyways that would be considered a danger point. Everybody's going across, it's wide open, and the Lance Corporal in front of me, he looked at me and said, sir, you need to cover this area. I said, cover this area? With what? He said, with your pistol. I looked down, because it was on my leg. I said, you should think I should get it out now? <laughs> He said, sir, this is about as good a time as any to pull that thing out. <laughs> we finally wound up outside the building for which this corpsman had been wounded. And if you look, I'm not sure if this laser, that guy with the black pack and no weapon is me trying to figure out exactly where this Marine, wa this corpsman was. He was up on the third floor. We were all underneath and never actually knew he was there. And when we got to him, he had a sucking chest wound, and we put an Asherman chest seal on him, and he stabilized, and we put him in the back of our vehicle. He was alive, and he was talking, and he was doing well, and I had had enough, really, of war. And no sooner did I get him in the back of the vehicle that I got the call from my operations officer. 